from there. Sorry. I'm back. We're going live. Okay. We are now streaming. Hi, everybody. It's always a mystery to me when it actually goes live on Facebook. Um, hi, I'm Sue Borison. Today I'm here with Dr. Jill Grimes, a board certified family physician and author of The Ultimate College Student ha Health Handbook. There we have it. There's a picture one more time. Um, <laughs> so Dr. Grimes, thanks so much for being with us today. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, there's so many words being thrown around for what today feels like, but the <laughs> most uh, the, the most difficult to live with is the uncertainty. Um, and so for people like me who sent a kid off to college, um, it's, you know, you don't know what to be afraid of. Even under the best of circumstances, you don't know what to be afraid of. Um, what do you think, like, what should we be telling our kids right now in terms of their behavior on campus, masks, and and this notion of pods where like now kids think 20 people can be in their pod. What, what are your thoughts on all of that? Oh, there's so much to say. If they, if they would limit it to truly 20, I think I'd be happy with that. <laughs> um, the recommendation is 10, but so I have, I have a lot to say about it. So I have two kids in college as well. One is in undergrad and one is in graduate school. Um, the undergrad student, actually all of her classes went online. So she is dealing with the challenges of completely remote learning and she is not on campus. That was the choice she made. Um, so that's a whole different set of issues. But for all the kids who are fortunate enough that they are able to go on campus, one, I'm, I'm, a, half I'm a glass half full kind of person. And so I really do think that the majority of students are very motivated to stay on campus. And as we've been watching all the universities open and then kind of close, open, close, um, you know, I think that's what we're just going to see this whole, especially September and October. I think it's going to surge and they're going to shut things down and go remote. And then they're going to come back and, you know, gradually go back online. So a couple things for the parents like you and me and many of our listeners. Um, let's have a little perspective. I think some of the good news early on is that, I mean, ideally, obviously, we don't want our kids to get COVID. Um, the reality is that many of them are going to. And the good news right now is that I have not heard of a single college student hospitalized yet. We do need to remember, again, perspective, and I'm not, not minimizing the severity of COVID, but we need to remember that the vast majority of the disease is mild and otherwise healthy young people. Now, I'm not going to the whole issue of everybody who works at the university and the people that they might be putting at risk. I'm, I'm, I'm purely at this moment focusing on your kid and their health. So what they can do to stay on campus and to minimize the spread is to, most importantly, I know everybody knows it, but wear their masks. But let me just say my, my two cents about the masks because I know we're hearing that all the time, but here's my issues. Number one, don't use the gator style mask. We were recommending those before, the single layer that you just pull up over your neck. Those aren't good. They're not effective. Um, we don't want to do that. Second, get some masks your kid will like. This is, um, this is one of my Harry Potter masks. You can't really see it, but it has like a Harry Potter symbol on it. Um, my favorite is my Wonder Woman mask. This is not to show off my mask, but the point is I want them to be cloth. Um, well, if you have the luxury of having the disposable surgical mask, use those. They're the best that we have outside of the N95s. And honestly, they're great. But if you don't have that and you're using cloth masks, and most college students are, so it's, it's becoming a much more acceptable sort of fashion accessory, you want two layers of cloth and then it should have an opening in it where you can put in a filter, whether that's one of these little um, PM 2.5 filters, or honestly, what I use most of the time is just a coffee filter. So you slip that inside there, and then you've got that third layer, because we, we know that the three layers is what is recommended. How often, and, how often so, are you supposed to change the filter? Every, every time when you, you know, you're leaving, put a new one in. Coffee filters are cheap, just put a new one in. And I'm glad you asked that because the other thing is you got to wash these, which is why I have like lots and lots. And I sent my kids, well, the one that went back to school, I sent her with honestly 14 because, you know, you don't do laundry every week necessarily. And so you want enough so that you have a fresh one every day. So, uh, and then of course you have to wear it. So it has to go over the nose and 
the chin and not be worn hanging off the air. Anyway, so that's that about masks. The main thing is if you leave your dorm room, you leave your apartment, your mask goes on and you leave it on. And I think more people are getting more comfortable with that. Parents, the problem is not in the classrooms. I do think the universities, what I'm hearing from kids across um, the country and the different campuses, there's very, very good, like 100% compliance of wearing masks in the classrooms. That's not where the problem is. The problem is, of course, going to parties. And so to your question, you know, kid, kids, are, <laughs> kids are social animals. All humans are social animals. And they're not gonna be satisfied if they are physically able to get together with friends. They're not gonna be satisfied, most likely. Some of the introverts are. <laughs> But, um, and, and that's not a slam. I, I, one of my kids is perfectly content Zooming with friends. But anyway, when they get together, it really just outside, outside is the best thing. Outside with a mask is the very best thing. When you start eating and drinking together, you, if, you just gotta be further away because your mask is off if you're eating and drinking. So, okay, so um, I just wanna throw out there for anybody who's listening right now, watching right now on Facebook, um, if you have any questions, put them in the comments and we're going to try to get to them during our discussion. Great. Okay, so um, so now we, we know a lot more about masks right now. Yes. Um, and so parents, you know, if you can send your kid a mask that meets all the criteria. Um, and let's move away from this conversation, which we're all we all need to have, but we're tired of. Right, um, and, right. and talk about what are the top three things you see college age kids they come to see you before they start college. What are the three top things you talk to them about? Actually, none of it's COVID. <laughs> I mean, because those conversations are continuing on. If they have questions about that, I'm happy to talk with them. But drinking is the number one thing. We unfortunately have about 2000 deaths per year in college students every year that are alcohol related. And that, you know, the deaths are obviously completely devastating, but we have a lot of other, you know, kids having injuries and concussions and problems with that. So I talk about binge drinking and my rules are everyone, you know, every family has their own set of, of ideals about this. And let me say 30% of college students don't drink at all. Not every college student drinks. That is not a given. That is what we see in every movie. That is what, if you ask a college kid what percentage of college students drink, they're gonna tell you 90%, 95, 100%. It's actually about 70% when you truly look at it and do surveys. Um, so not everybody drinks, but if you drink, my, I encourage them, if you drink, drink beer or wine. We rarely treat alcohol toxicity from kids who were doing that. Alcohol toxicity generally by and large in college students comes from doing shots. What's common on college campuses is vodka shots. So the binge and, drinking worries you more than the, than the red solo of beer. Yes, exactly. Now a red solo of trash can punch still worries me more than the other, but yes, it really does because- And do you think you have an impact on these kids when you're talking to them? Like what's your, what's your message? Oh, Yes, because, because I'm not leading with never drink, never do this. Ne I don't lead with never. I lead with if you choose to do this. And I talk about that not everybody does these things because the, honestly, kids are shocked to hear that. They're like, really? And on, in some friend groups, that is not the case. Some friend groups, 100% are smoking pot, drinking, uh, you know, very high risk behaviors. And so- Yes, they do hear me because one, I really, I really try not to be judgmental about it. Everyone brings different beliefs about this to the table, but I am very clear about what is medically risky. And that's what I talk about. Like when I talk about pot, I don't, uh, so pot is legal in some states. Um, again, it's, it's, it's only legal if you're 21, it's not supposed to be on college campuses. It is on every college campus. And so when I talk about that, I talk about very specific risks and things that they may not know about pot. Right now, I add in with COVID, one of the things that we need to do for COVID is to keep our respiratory tract healthy. So that includes taking care of allergies. If you have seasonal allergies, being proactive about that, using nasal steroids every day, not smoking, not vaping, 
you know, we've, we've stopped talking about smoking and pot and alcohol because all we're talking about is COVID, but all these things are still real risk for our college students. And so that's what I focus on. Because we're compromised, they're like smoke will compromise your respiratory tract, which if you get COVID, then it makes it harder to, to deal with. Is that the story? Actually, weirdly, that's not playing out as much as, um, cause we really thought like people with asthma and smokers would be, have much more serious COVID. No, my point is actually just that whether it's allergies or smoke or allergens, um, mold in an old dorm room, all those things irritate your respiratory tract. And so instead of having a nice smooth barrier in our respiratory tract, you've got little micro abrasions in there and it just makes it easier to catch any virus, including COVID. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so that so we we hit alcohol, we hit smoking, and what's the third thing? Um, sex. Um, well, actually, yes, that's an issue as well. And um, talk about how about hookups, and uh, especially right now, you know, online dating, um, using all the dating apps, Tinder and Bumble, and I mean, there's a hundred, but those are the two most common. Um, they're even more common now because people are trying to be cautious about who they're meeting. But you know, my, my general message is if you're gonna to choose to be intimate, you need to use protection. And we talk about condoms, talk about HPV vaccine, all the things you can do to protect yourself against sexually transmittable infections as well as pregnancy. Um, so that is something I talk about. But actually <clears throat> time management and so, as much as we see strep throat and sprained ankles and concussions and alcohol toxicity, we see just as much test anxiety, insomnia, depression, homesickness that balloons into bigger anxiety and depression. So that is absolutely something that I talk about as well. Okay, man, the list is long. I know. Sorry. That's, that's why I ended up writing a whole book, because quite honestly, you just, you just, I tried to package it all in first aid kit. Like this is, my daughter's name is Nicole. So this is her kit. But you know, there's just a lot to say. But anyway, far away, ask me what you want to focus okay, on. Okay, so, so I want to flip it and say, what are the kinds of questions that might surprise parents that you get from the kids? Well, some of it goes back to what I just talked about. A lot of kids look me in the eye and say, why is pot bad? Or why is vaping bad? Nicotine isn't a big deal. Um, so they'll ask me a lot about that. They'll ask me how much alcohol is it okay if I drink? How much damage am I doing long-term if I binge drink? Um, what do I do about a roommate who is getting blackout drunk every night? Um, what's the difference between blackout and brownout drunk? Oh, well, so tell us the answer to the <laughs> question. Sorry. I, think Sorry. People, I don't think parents will. First of all, I want to say that um, if we lump everything you said together, they're, they're all about risk management. So they yes. want to assess how much can I do before this creates a, pro a real problem? But then right. what are the, what are the, what's the difference between blackout and brown? And, and then one other question you said, I can't remember. Right, so, okay, sorry. So start with alcohol. So kids will say, you know, how bad is it if I, if I binge drink just every um, Friday and Saturday, every weekend? And so cumulatively, it's, it's difficult to say, but one of the things I talk about is the, the, the other things that happen. So one, you can actually, of course, drink too much and get true alcohol toxicity. And I explain how when a lot of, a lot of kids don't understand why, why is it so risky if you black out so, um, or pass out. Blackout refers to not having memory of the night before. Brownout is a fuzzy memory of the night before. And all of that is different from being just unconscious. So the, um, the danger is I talk about when, you know, if you're drinking water or just swallowing and suddenly you, it goes down the wrong pipe and you coddlingly, I mean, it's just, you know, we really force it out of our lungs. Everyone's had that experience. Well, when you're drunk, when you're intoxicated, that gag reflex gets shut off. So meanwhile, your alcohol levels have built up, you're getting nausea, your liver's 
is um, inflamed and, ca and causing nausea, your stomach's directly irritated, causing nausea, you're passed out, you throw up, but you don't have that gag reflex to get it out of your lungs if a little bit goes that way. And so you can literally choke on it. And when I explain it like that, kid, that makes sense. And people can understand that. And um, so they, they get that. I talk about the specific risks of doing shots and how the problem is you do shots so quickly, you know, that's the point of a shot that, and people will do five shots in an hour or 30 minutes, even worse. And that's enough to cause serious alcohol toxicity. And it, it, your blood alcohol level rises very quickly and you don't get the warning signs. If you're drinking beer and sip, you know, drinking your beer, if it fills up your stomach, you're drinking it kind of slowly, you get, you get the little bit of buzz, you get that pleasant feeling, you get all of that before you get the, oh my gosh, I'm starting to have too much. Things are getting a bit, you know, blurry or I'm feeling dizzy and then throwing up. You get some warning that that's coming and you stop. So that's, so I go back to that. Let's see. Um, I'm curious, do you think parents um, like are aware of what really happens on college campuses? Like they're the movies that we see and there's the stories that we hear, but you know, when you actually go and see what's happening on college campuses, it's a little eye-opening. I, I think most parents, not all, most parents are pretty shocked. I know that, um, you know, it, it all depends on your college experience and what you did. And uh, if you were a big partier, you know, parents our age, I'm assuming you and I must be roughly the same age. Um, uh, you know, back then, in order to get more alcohol into your system, people did beer bongs, and you know, because because drinking beer by itself wasn't enough, you know, so that you had to get it in fast to get a bigger buzz. That was really much more prevalent, and what is done now is more dangerous. The other thing that's way more dangerous now is mixing ADD meds, attention deficit disorder medications, with alcohol, and that that is I dedicated a whole chapter to that in this book because people. So when you take an ADD med, it's a stimulant, right? And what happens is if you take your ADD med and then you have alcohol, you don't feel anything. So you do a shot, you feel nothing. You do another shot, you feel nothing. You have three, maybe four drinks before the stimulant and the sedative effect balance out and people go from, from feeling like they're fine to suddenly being super drunk and passing out. And I really think that that's contributing, I know I see it a lot, and that that's contributing a great deal to the excess of drinking because people don't feel it because of the ADD meds. And that's a super okay, me, dangerous combination. Let me just remind people, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We're gonna be on for a few more minutes. Um, so you encourage this, uh, you held it up before, a college first aid kit. Yes. Yes. Um, and so it, are there like some obvious things? I mean, I, I sent five kids to college. I never gave one of them a college first aid kit. So tell me what I should have done. Tell me how, how uh, what you know, what okay. should I do? All right. So um, I've been doing this for 10 years. That, that's, uh, that's my, I mean, I'm a family physician. I'm a girl, I was a Girl Scout leader. I'm crafty. You know, this is what I do. So this was a complete natural for me. So. Um, I have a lot of things on the list for the first aid kit. And if you want to see the full list, you can go to my website or it's, uh, I've got a shopping list that you pull out from the book, but um, my website's just my name, jillgrimesmd.com. But, but here's the things that people forget um, or maybe the whole thing, right? <laughs> um, so for sure this year, if at all possible, you want a thermometer. And my, I prefer a oral digital thermometer because they're generally more accurate. But right now, honestly, they're hard to find. And frankly, the, I bought a few that were not accurate at all. So if you're going to do a thermometer now, these no touch ones, um, you know, uh, you have to have some kind of working thermometer. And that was true before COVID and it will be true after COVID, but it's especially true right now. Um, things that parents forget. First, um, an ACE wrap. Sprained ankles are super common. I always say put two ACE wraps in because the roommate's going to sprain their ankle before you are or the sweet mate or the person down the hall. These things disappear like, you know, candy. So ACE wrap in there. Um, Tums. It doesn't have to be Tums. It can be a different name brand. I happen to like Tums, but 
when you get heartburn, which happens a lot when you're pounding caffeine, when you're studying for finals, basic old fashioned, um, any, any chewable antacid will do, but that works faster than any prescription medicine or any, um, any of the pills that you swallow. Those are, you know, like Tigamet or Prilosec, any of those name brands. Um, these work instantly. So I always include those in there. Uh, good band-aids. Don't go for cheap band-aids. Good band-aids. You want the finger ones and, um, and you know, this is a generic, uh, grocery store brand. It doesn't have to be expensive, but get the good ones that actually stay on. If you have an architect major, I'm telling you right now, stock up, maybe <laughs> invest in the company because they cut themselves with their, um, uh, their it's like a box cutter looking thing. When they're, make, when they're building other projects, we, we do a lot of stitching on them. But blisters from walking across campus, band good band-aids are key. Um, I do for pain relievers and fever reducers, all of them because we use them differently. And um, again, I'm not trying to totally push my book, but I do explain that in the book because it's time to use Tylenol us, versus Advil. I'll look up one more time so people can. Sure. So if you're looking for the, the real details of all of this, you can just buy the College Student Health Handbook. The ultimate College the ultimate. Student Health Handbook. There you go. Your guide for everything from hangovers to homesickness. But okay, so, so Tylenol, Tylenol, Advil, and um, plus or minus aspirin. These are and, the, some, some of them are obvious and some of them like the, th the thermometer. Oh, really important to have. Yeah. And especially this year, but uh, uh, well, especially always, this is um, Pedialyte powder. I don't care if you use Gatorade powder, Powerade, whatever, sports drink. Um, I actually go for the, the uh, generic of the um, electrolyte powders because when you get sick, like say you get sick with COVID, you need to rehydrate. And so having these rehydration powders that you can just put in your water bottle is key. So I always throw in, you know, either a box of these or at least a handful of these to toss in there. All right. That's, that's a really great one. Um, and again, for the rest of the list, you can also go to the website. So we have a question from someone listening right now. Are there tips you can give students to stay safe? For example, the buddy system when going out or walking yes. on college campus. Absolutely. I'm big on the buddy system and not only the buddy system, but code words. Um, it, it's very, students are actually very creative about helping one another. Um, one student group I was talking with, they said they had a plan, um, you know, they would have a code word. That, so this was a group of girls and going out and it's important for guys too, but um, it's, it's a bit sexist to just talk about girls. But when we worry about issues around sexual assault, which can happen to guys or girls, um, but if they start feeling unsafe, they had a code word, which was a name of their TA in one of their classes. It was an unusual last name. And they would, they would bring that up and everyone else knew it was time to leave. The other thing is they came up with this, not me. If you're feeling uncomfortable yourself, worst case, and you, you, you don't have a friend to exit with, spill your drink on yourself on purpose. Oops, I gotta go, exit quickly, um, yes. Decide how much you're drinking before you go. Stick with that. Do your best to have one designated non-drinker. This doesn't, whether there's Uber or not, it's still good to have somebody who's really got a clear head and who can kind of watch the rest of the group that night and, you know, see who's doing what. It's okay. With COVID, as I say, with COVID, we shouldn't be having big, big crowded groups, but we're still going out. Okay, Carol, I hope that answered your question. If you have any other questions, we're gonna be wrapping up soon. Just throw them in the, in the comments. Um, and I, I just, I want to, well, if, if anybody has another question, we'll add it in, but I wanna to get to like the, the um, hopeful. Zoom? Oh, hopeful. Uh, the hopeful part of, of college and kids. So, oh yeah, I, I did like that question a lot. Okay, let's do that one, which is how, what do we do about Zoom fatigue? So okay. any, any tips there? Yes. And parents, this is, this is for us too, because we're all zooming. You're yeah. zooming right now, right? So exactly. So a couple things. One, um, we, so zooming is actually more exhausting than sitting in a classroom. You are focused on the speaker, especially for whether it's an adult meeting or, or kids in school, 
you're, you know, you're expected to be looking. And so it's, it's more attention than you're used to doing. Also, we don't blink as much. So your eyes actually get dried out and tired. I, you know, keep eye drops there, put eye drops, just, just, um, just the saline drops, not to get the red out. Those are, those are not good for your eyes, but just those, or if your eyes get really tired, I like these little gel. Um, this, is, this brand is Refresh Cellulisk, but you can do a gel that just take a five minute break and put that in and do that in between your meetings. It will really help. We're drawn to look at ourselves. So if you have your picture up there, usually it's you know on the top right or you know, when you're looking, you can right click on it. I just learned this last week. So you can make that go away. You right click and there's an option to hide self because we can't help it. We're just so beautiful that we must look at it ourselves. But really all kidding aside, we're drawn to look at ourselves. And when you're trying to watch that and, talk, and watch the other, that's not good. For our kids, put away the switch switch light, whatever your gaming device is. It's really tempting to have that down here off camera and be playing that when you're bored. And you think you're able to pay attention to both, but you're not. For all of us, close out all your other tabs. Don't be switching back and working on your email at the same time. You, again, you think you're paying attention, but you're not. And, and your brain is just having to focus on all these things and then you're way more exhausted afterwards. So those are a few quick Zoom tips. Yeah, the, the eye drop one is a good one because my eyes get to start feeling so tired and I can't imagine if you're going to school all day in front oh. of the computer what that must be like. Okay. Exactly. Um, I, I think, uh, let's, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, so I think that we're going to end on a positive note. Please tell us when you see these kids, how you, like what, I think they're they're extraordinary as a generation in a way that no other generation has been tasked with. Um, they've lived <laughs> so much, and they're they're just so wise in in what I see. Um, what do you, what do you see when they come to you? Are you hopeful? I'm extremely hopeful. Um, you, you know, not just as a parent, but something I tell people. You know, as a as a physician, particularly as a physician who's been on a college campus seeing patients. These kids, they come in and, you know, they're they're injured. They're at the end of their rope um, from from stress, or they're just really really sick. And you know what? They're polite. They're consistently, you know, they tell us thank you. They're they're uh, they're good at their worst, is what I'm trying to say. And far more of these, I mean, then these kids, they want to change the world. They have big plans and I have every confidence. We're seeing that they're doing it. I mean, my gosh, they, they're doing such unique things during quarantine. There's, they're coming up with ways to help others. They're, they're very innovative and resilient. And this fall doesn't look anything like any of us wanted. It doesn't look like I, I wanted it or you wanted it or our kids wanted it, but you know, there's silver linings to everything. And so um, I really am optimistic. I think colleges will be able to, I, I really hope the spring will look a lot more like it used to. It won't be completely, but I think we will have it figured out how to more do testing and tracing and isolating, and that will allow more in-person things. And this fall, the whole key is gonna be flexibility. It's gonna be the back and forth from online to in-person and a lot about personal choices and, um, a lot of kids are exerting positive peer pressure within their groups. And I think the more we see that, the, the more they're going to get to do things together in person. Okay, Dr. Jill Grimes, author of, hold the book up one more time, The Ultimate College Student Health Handbook. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it.